My name's David Vaughan and together with the organisation Postbellum, I'm the author of the exhibition No Night So Dark. It's about the Vels family and it's taking place in the Winternitz Villa here in Prague 5. And because all cultural institutions in the Czech Republic are currently closed, we've decided to prepare a short virtual tour of the exhibition. The exhibition tells the story of the Wells family. Uh, the family were quite exceptional in their enormous creative energy and, and imagination. But their story was interrupted and they were meant to be completely forgotten. It was only thanks to a, a small miracle in the midst of the tragedy of the Holocaust that the story of the family survives. It was preserved, the family archive was preserved in a box in Oxford, in a suburban house, and that's where it stayed for many years, in the form of thousands of fragments. What we tried to do was to put together all these fragments so that the different members of different generations of the family could tell their own story. So now let's go upstairs where the exhibition continues. Now it's not by chance that we're here in the wonderful space of the Winternitz Villa in Prague 5. This was designed by none other than the great architect Adolf Loos. And Rudolf Wells, who was one member of the Wells family, he studied under Adolf Loos and he also worked with him closely. And Rudolf would have identified closely with this kind of space. So the exhibition, I think, is very much at home. So now we're going to go upstairs where the exhibition continues. So we've come upstairs and this is the main bedroom, which when the villa was first built uh, in the early 1930s would have looked very much like this. And next door is where the children had their nursery and where they slept. And that's the part of the villa where exhibitions take place. And that's where the story of the Wells family continues. And well, we start with a family tree going back to the beginning of the 19th century. Key figures in this story are Josefina and Shimon, and then his son, the architect Rudolf, and Colin Wells, or Wells, who lives in Oxford now. Uh, the box that we've been talking about is in his house. And to continue with the story of the family, we need to go back to Oxford and to the mid-1980s. Uh, this is Tomasz Wells, uh, and in 1984 he had to go into hospital for a, an operation, a heart operation. And his son Colin visited him, and um, suddenly, out of the blue, Tomasz said, I want to tell you more about my past, before I came to England from Czechoslovakia in 1939. Uh, and Tomasz had never spoken to his three children about his past before he came to Britain. Uh, and this came as a complete surprise. And Colin really knew nothing about his family's history. Uh, ironically, three days later, Tomasz uh, had a massive stroke and he never spoke again. And it was at this point that Colin and his brother and sister decided to open the box. They always knew that their father had this box of family things in the back of a cupboard, but they never knew anything about what it contained. And here is Colin, here are some of the things, and it's an immense variety, diversity of, of stuff. And this is really where the path, where Colin's path to finding his own family's past began. And the first thing, the very first thing that he discovered at the top, when he first opened the box, was this book, uh, Ubernatu, At the Bernards. 
uh, memories or memoirs from 1803 to 1897 and the author Shimon Wells and there's an illustration of a, of a village green. And this, when you open the book, handwritten, it's the memoir of Colin's great-grandfather, Shimon Wells. He was a, an ordinary man, he was a villager, he uh, didn't have a great deal of education, but he had an immense literary talent. The, his memoir is an, a delight to read, it's full of life, it gives you a vivid picture of the lives of members of the family and of the people around them in the village. Uh, Shimon had a, a small shop, which you can see here on the right hand side from a photograph from the time. Uh, the village hasn't changed that much since then. If you look at photographs of what the village green looks like today, uh, this is the, the house where the family lived in, in the 19th century. Uh, this is the synagogue, which again, um, Shimon writes about vividly in his memoir. And the Jewish cemetery also survives in the village. And this, for example, is the, the, the grave of one of uh, the uh, members of the, the Wells, previously Vedeles, family, so ancestors of Colin. And um, there's one rather wonderful story in the memoir, which tells us how um, Shimon's parents came to be married in the 1830s. Uh, and Shimon's mother, Josefina, was in love with Bernard, and, but she could only marry him with the permission of, of, of the local aristocrat, that was uh, Count Sternberg, because there were very strict discriminatory laws limiting uh, the possibilities for Jews to marry. And she had to negotiate a, an exception to the rule to be able to marry um, her beloved Bernard. And she walked, and it's beautifully described in the book, all the way to Prague from the village, and then all the way to Karlovy Vary, to Karlsbad, uh, found the Count Sternberg and persuaded him. And uh, according to the memoirs, uh, he was very sympathetic and he was uh, delighted by the fact that she was so in love with the, with the man that she, she, she wanted to marry that he gave her the, the, exce the exception to the rule, which is actually recorded in, in rather less romantic terms in the um, Austro-Hungarian official um, records of the time. Shimon um, and his wife Aneshka uh, had a little boy uh, in uh, 1882. He was um, Rudolf. And uh, sadly, two years later, Aneshka died, but, she, uh, but Shimon remarried and had two further children. Uh, and Rudolf was an extremely bright boy. And uh, Shimon realised it. And he decided that he wanted to get, make sure that Rudolf got the best possible education. And he, uh, he went to the the local Catholic grammar school in Bolzang and persuaded them to take his, take his son, which was unusual for a Jewish family. Uh, but the teaching methods were extremely archaic. And when Shimon realised that his son was not getting the education that he thought he'd be getting, he had the cheek to go to the, uh, to go to the school and say, I don't want my son to go here anymore. And he sent him instead to the local industrial school, which was the best thing he could possibly have done because Rudolf was uh, always interested in everything connected with building. Uh, and as soon as he uh, completed school and had finished his military service, he went and worked for a builder in Prague, a very well-known builder who built a lot of uh, significant buildings in Prague at the turn of the century. And one of them was, uh, for example, the, the Jerusalem synagogue, uh, which um, Rudolf, as a, as a, as a young builder would have, would have uh, helped to, to, to work on. And in the meantime, he was doing his uh, builder's exams. And as I said, he was very bright. And in 1907, he won uh, a place at the Vienna Academy of Arts. This was just about the same time, just ironically, that, um, that Adolf Hitler was rejected by the same school. Uh, Rudolf studied there, he um, 
didn't particularly enjoy it. He, again, he thought it was rather conservative. Uh, and here are some of his uh, designs and drawings from the time of his studies. Uh, it's interesting, for example, that he did some designs for Prague. This is for uh, a sort of urban plan for the, for the quay along by the, uh, the Vltava River. Uh, and towards the end of his studies, he um, made or got to know the famous uh, architect and a far more progressive figure of the time, Adolf Loos, who Rudolf felt much closer to. This is Adolf Loos who was keen on the rejection of or ornament and he was uh, uh, very uh, adamant that uh, all um, architectural design needs to be carried out in space. It's not a question of plans and sections, but uh, you have to design in space. And this was all very, uh, this was something that uh, Rudolf identified with closely. So he started going to Adolf Loos's lecturers, lectures, and he actually worked with Adolf Loos in his office. Here's a letter from uh, Adolf Loos confirming that uh, Rudolf works in his office. And here's a wonderful architectural drawing by, um, by Rudolf of a design uh, by uh, Adolf Loos for a department store in, uh, in Alexandria, which was never built. And, Rudolf, and Adolf Loos loved this sketch so much that he had it in, hanging in his living room. Rudolf Els was in Vienna when the First World War broke out and he was sent to the front uh, and uh, luckily he survived. He was injured but, uh, and he was uh, sent to hospital in um, Cheb in Western Bohemia and actually not far from where he had grown up. And it was there that he got to know uh, a young girl who was volunteering as a nurse at the time. She was also from a Jewish family. Uh, her family, it was a wealthy Jewish family from the town of Cheb, and they fell in love and got married. These are some photos of her family. Uh, and they spent the last two years of the First World War in Vienna, where um, Rudolf continued doing various design projects. One of the things that he designed was a, a garden city for children, which was a very utopian project, um, which, uh, for example, includes uh, a Catholic church, a Protestant church, and a synagogue all next to one another. Um, I think that he was, uh, his idealism was very much influenced by his experiences of the front in the First World War. And at the end of the war, the family returned, well, Rudolf, Rudolf and Ida returned to Bohemia, to the new Czechoslovakia, and they uh, moved to a flat in, in Karlovy Vary, in Karlsbad. Uh, and this was the beginning of a very successful and, I think, happy time for the family. They had two children, uh, two sons, Martin, who was, uh, well, Tomáš, who was born in 1920, and then Martin, who was born five years later, in 1925. And um, Rudolf got lots of work. Here are some examples of buildings that he designed. This, the most famously, probably among them, is the miner's house in uh, the town of Sokolov, in Western Bohemia. Um, other buildings, for example, the health uh, insurance building in Kalovivari, which is also still standing, uh, which was a very, very modern for its time. And you can also see uh, the influence of uh, Adolf Loos and the, especially his ideas of, of, of space and working with space, for example, in this building or in the wonderful entrance to the, um, to the Jewish Old People's Home in Karlovivari, which he also designed. And they were a happy family. Also, Rudolf had a, an immense artistic talent, which we can see in this series of designs, of, of, of glass designs, which he did for the famous Moser factory. In the box in uh, Collins House in Oxford, there are many photographs from this time, which really do show a happy family. Uh, I particularly love this photograph of the the family on a holiday in uh, Rügen, in, on the Baltic coast of Germany. Uh, also here is uh, the death notice of Shimon Fels, the grandfather, who died in November 1922.
The family then moved to Prague in 1933. I think it's not entirely coincidental that they moved in 1933, this year that Hitler came to power in neighbouring Germany, uh, because uh, it was getting increasingly difficult for Jewish families in the mainly German-speaking parts of Czechoslovakia. Uh, and so they moved to Prague. Um, Rudolf went into partnership with another architect called Guido, or Guido Lagos, and they, their partnership was extremely successful. They built a number of, of really wonderful um, and very modern apartment blocks, all of which are still standing in Prague today, uh, which are really very sophisticated in their detail and, and uh, with these very simple lines and using marble, which is typical for uh, the students of, of Adolf Loos. They also designed the, passa, the, the passage, the arcade, the Alpha Arcade, which is just off Wenceslas Square in Prague, and the, uh, the cinema that was in there, the cinema and theatre space. And that uh, was where the uh, famous comedy film, Hey Rup, which means Heave Ho, had its premiere in 1934. And interestingly, Rudolf Fels and, and Guido Lagus uh, were the architects who worked on this film. So uh, when you see the film, one of the first things you see in the titles is that it takes place on sets designed by Lagus and Wells. Here you can see, and they went on and they worked on several other films together. Uh, so this is a very, very fruitful cooperation. Then a much more difficult period began for the family. Uh, at the end of September 1938, the Munich Agreement was signed, which gave Hitler uh, vast tracts of Czechoslovakia and destabilised the country. And at this stage, um, Rudolf and the family realised that as a Jewish family, even though they were in Prague and not in the borderlands, that um, their future was far from certain. And they applied for uh, a visa to emigrate to the United States. But in the meantime, while they were waiting, life went on. And there's one rather delightful episode from that period, which uh, is from Christmas 1938. Uh, at that time, Tomáš was 18 and Martin was uh, 13. And Martin was extremely gifted artistically. Uh, and we can see this in this book that the two boys gave to their parents and their grandmother for Christmas 1938. They were a Jewish family, but they celebrated Christmas anyway. Um, and this is scenes from their daily life. And it goes between German and Czech, because they spoke both languages and they would, uh, the, it was quite natural them to sort of shift between the two languages. Uh, and Martin did the the illustrations which illustrate the scenes and it's it's an amazing fly on the wall picture of li the life of a middle class family in Prague in the late 1930s with these delightful drawings by Martin. Uh, the book ends with a little paragraph that Martin wrote about the future where he says um, we're not sure about the future we're going to have to move somewhere else but we are confident that our life is going to carry on as normal. Of course, there's a deep irony in that, because that isn't what happened. In March 1939, on the 15th of March 1939, German troops marched into Prague. And ironically, a week later, on the 22nd of March 1939, the uh, American embassy sent the family a letter uh, postponing their visa application, which meant effectively that they were trapped for good in in the occupied um, so-called protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia. There was no way of getting out. What happened was Tomáš, who was already an adult pretty much, he managed to escape. He smuggled his way across the Polish border and he got as far as um, Britain. And uh, this is where um, his story and the story of the rest of the family divide. He uh, wrote a description of how he escaped, where it ends very movingly with the description of, with him writing, uh, I arrived in Dover as a refugee, but as a refugee in a free country and glad to be a refugee. 
The rest of the family was trapped and uh, there were more and more restrictions. Before long they had to leave their very comfortable flat in a block that Rudolf had designed in Prague 7. They had to move into one room. Uh, but they had uh, close friends in the form of uh, the family, the Stifter family. Um, Josef Stifter was a Protestant pastor. Uh, and they uh, continued to remain friends through, during the occupation, which was frowned upon because uh, people were discouraged from mixing with Jewish families. Uh, there's a photograph here from March 1930, uh, 1941, which is the birthday of the, of the Protestant pastor, uh, Josef Stifter. Here is Rudolf Wells. Here is um, Ida Wells sitting there, and there's Martin in the corner and those are various members of the Stifter family. So they were very uh, close friends. Of course, Rudolf was no longer able to work as an architect, and he managed to, to, to make a living by doing, for example, some sketches, which are amazingly good, of various sites in Prague, which were then turned into um, prints. Uh, and one thing that uh, Ida, who was, uh, I think, a very strong woman, did. She persuaded her husband uh, to transcribe the whole of his father's memoir, Ubernatu, which we were talking about a little while earlier. Uh, and he did, he transcribed it, and that, the, the book as it survives, uh, is as it was transcribed by, um, by Rudolf and with an illustration on the front by Martin. Uh, and so, it's thanks to them that we can read that, we can read the memoir today. Then the inevitable happened. The uh, family were summoned to uh, join uh, a transport to the ghetto in Terezin, which was about 40 miles north of Prague. Uh, and they had to write, which also survives in the box in Collins' uh, house in Oxford, they had to write a detailed list of all their property and its value, including socks, underwear, everything, uh, because they were only allowed to take 50 kilos with them. Uh, and just before they went to the, uh, to, to the ghetto, uh, the family left all their most valuable items with their friends, the Stifters, all their most valuable personal belongings they left with, uh, with the Stifters. These are the things that survive today. Uh, Initially, uh, from uh, the Terezin ghetto, they were occasionally able to write letters or very short cards, always in German. They always had to be in German, two friends in Prague. Uh, so we know that, um, for example, that uh, Ida and Rudolf and Martin were able to see each other regularly in the ghetto. Uh, Ida was living in the, Ham the Hamburg um, barracks uh, where she was working in the department which was housed the newly arrived prisoners. In September 1943, the uh, family, Ida, Rudolf and Martin, were sent on, were deported further to the east, to Auschwitz. And uh, there they were uh, imprisoned in the so-called family camp, where they were actually able to be together, uh, but the conditions were, were awful, grim, and there are a few short cards that survive from that time written in this very fragile hand where we can see that this was all that was left of, of their rich lives. They were murdered um, on the 8th of March 1944 uh, along with thousands of others from the uh, family camp. In the meantime, Tomasz was in Britain and uh, early in the war he fell in love and married Joy, an English woman, and um, he was studying uh, engineering and then in the course of the war he uh, joined the army and the Royal Air Force in fact and he served in the uh, 311th Czechoslovak. Bomber Squadron, uh, and their first son, Ivan, or Ivan, 
was born in 1944. He went on to have two more children, Colin and Tanya. Immediately after the war, Tomasz came back to Prague and very quickly uh, realized that nobody from his family had survived. He went to see the Stifter family and they gave him the things that his parents had left with them when they went to the Terezin, the Terezin ghetto. Uh, and he took them back with him, with him to England. Uh, he brought, it must have been a huge trauma for him because he never spoke with his children about the past. Uh, and so after he died, it was up to his children really to try and put together the pieces of the family story from these things which we've seen here in the exhibition, which survived. And Tom, Colin was lucky in that he had a good friend called Jerry who spoke Czech, because of course Colin couldn't read any of the stuff, because it was all either in German or Czech, and he only spoke English. But his friend Jerry uh, spoke Czech, he had a Czech wife, and he translated uh, Shimon's memoir, Ubernatu. Uh, into English and so suddenly the family had a, a gateway into their own family's past, into their life in 19th century rural Bohemia. And uh, Jerry's wife, Aletze, she uh, took a photocopy of the manuscript. Uh, this was still under communism, this was in 1986. She took a, photo a photocopy of the manuscript to the uh, Czech poet, Zbigniew Heida in Prague. And he loved it and immediately published it in Some Is That. And then in 1989 came the fall of communism and the borders were opened and the Wells family from Britain started coming to Czechoslovakia. And one particularly happy episode in this story is that they've built up in the years since the fall of communism, they've built up a close friendship with the, with the children, grandchildren of the pastor, Josef Stifter, thanks to whom all the family things were preserved. And so there is this very uh, strong link that's maintained between uh, the family and, and the Czech Republic. Today, Shimon Vels has 10 great-great-grandchildren. And I think this is a small victory, given that the Nazis tried to wipe out the family. Ida, Rudolf and Martin didn't survive but their memory does and the family continues to thrive.